This is me at the beginning of this video. Hi. And this is me after tons of gameplay at the end of this video. I just started playing Star Wars The Old Republic for the very first time about 10 days ago. Let me take you through this MMO, show you my journey, and give you some of my first impressions of this 12-year-old galactic adventure game. First, what is Star Wars The Old Republic? Not to be confused with Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which is an RPG set in the same universe. Star Wars The Old Republic is a free-to-play, with optional subscription, story-driven, tab-target MMORPG developed by BioWare, which was released in 2011. Since its release, the game has received 8 content expansions, taking the original level cap from 50 all the way up to 80, with many different new areas and storylines. Unfortunately, for free-to-play players, the level cap is 60, and if you want to progress further, you will have to purchase the subscription but we'll get into more on that later. Players join as members of either of the two main factions, the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire. Although each faction might be considered good or evil, every player is in control of their own morality through a point system that caters to the light or dark side. The game focuses very heavily on storyline, offering a vast amount of differing options from the species and class you choose all the way to the individual choices that you make in side quests each of these decisions actually impacting the storyline that you create for your character. I've seen this done in many RPGs before, of course it's quite reminiscent of the Fable purity system. However, I've never actually seen this system utilized in an MMO before, and it's done quite well. The Old Republic also features the ability to fly your own ships and participate in space combat, four different modes for PvP, one that even includes the ability to PvP while being in your own ship, for some serious galactic warfare as well as war zones, a team-based domination game, and of course, arenas. Generally, in my limited experience, many games that I have played in the past which are based on an already successful franchise tend to cheap out on some of the important aspects of what can make them a good product. Whether that be a spin-off, a comic, a sequel, or in this case, a video game, because they can find success just through thriving on the franchise's already active fanbase. I've never really enjoyed too many Star Wars games in the past, as I've generally been much more of a fan of fantasy rather than sci-fi. Give me shields and swords and magic and throw in a dragon or two, and that's usually my happy place. But I was excited to step a bit out of my comfort zone in this case, and I'm hoping that some of that franchisal regression doesn't affect this game or my experience in enjoying it as an MMO. Upon opening the game and creating a character, I was asked if I would like to boost that character to level 70. At this point, I had not even purchased the subscription, so I don't think this was actually available to me, but afterwards, I had to choose between joining the Republic or the Sith faction. Generally, in video games, I tend to go towards the lighter side, if you will. I always played Alliance in WoW. I always tried to be the good guy, the hero. So I decided to change that up a bit and join the Edgelords over in the Sith. Each faction has four different completable origin stories which will dictate how the story in the game progresses for you, and each of these origin stories have a different set of classes or combat styles, as they're called, that it can play. There are eight different combat styles for each faction, although many of them are considered to be a mirror class, so they generally have the same skill set and gameplay as a class from the other faction just with different names and narrative direction. For example, an assassin on the Sith side would have a mirror class known as a Shadow on the Republic side. I was thoroughly impressed with how streamlined the character customization felt from class descriptions to animations to how much you can actually customize your character. I think it's important for games to focus on this as it's usually the first interface that your new players interact with, and when it's done properly and it feels good while giving players enough choice in terms of customization, but not too much so that they might feel overwhelmed, it can actually result in players spending a lot more time in the game than they might otherwise. Anyways, I ended up choosing the Sith Inquisitor origin story and went with the combat style of Marauder a sort of evilish dual-wielding rogue warrior hybrid. It sounded super cool to me, and I was excited to pave my journey as a Sith and to get into some double lightsaber combat. The graphical style of the game immediately stood out to me as stylistic and somehow had a very Star Wars feel, if that makes any sense. A lot of the different zones in this game look absolutely fantastic, and I'll get more into that later, but after a quick introduction to my character's storyline, I am a slave. Great. I was then greeted with this user interface. How do I explain this? At first, I hated it. I'm not gonna lie, I did not like the user interface, I didn't like the color scheme, the futuristic vibe made it feel more complicated than it is, the giant map in the middle of the screen, the wall of text and activities on the left-hand side, and it was immediately off-putting to me. 
However, it's really quite simple, and this was a very temporary gripe for me, especially later on as I learned some more of the customization that I was able to do. Someone immediately invited me to a guild named Vengeance, which I thought was a cool name, and I joined up. I was surprised to see quite a few other players around me, as generally MMOs of this age don't have too many players still active in the starting areas. However, as I would later come to realize, alts are an important part of journeying through this game as people like to play through all of the different storylines that are available. Compared to most MMOs where you might create an alt character to somehow benefit your main or just to try an entirely different playstyle, in Star Wars The Old Republic, the game actually has massive replayable appeal. By getting access to different parts of the storyline and creating a new character with different choices and ideas, you can even unlock different cutscenes and voice lines. The Old Republic has over 5,500 playable quests or missions, and the vast majority of those are voice acted. I'm not kidding. Even your player character has their own voice acting. Draw your lightsaber. Show me how powerful you really are. This is massively impressive, especially when considering that each voice has to be done in both genders and a multitude of different languages as well. Initially, I thought I was just in a sort of tutorial stage where they tend to up the quality of questing and the story for the first bit, but no. As I continued through the game, I was continuously blown away at the sheer quantity of good voice acting that persisted, even in simple side missions that are easily missed or avoidable. Sure, lots of other MMOs have voice acting, but not to the extent that you'll find in this game. It's actually fantastic. And as somebody who generally loves the stories of MMOs, but can't be bothered to read paragraph after paragraph, this was perfect for me. My first impressions of combat were pretty standard. Abilities felt smooth and streamlined. I was able to take on multiple mobs at once, and generally, most things fell over pretty quickly. I'll have lots to say about the combat later after I've gotten more abilities and tried things, but overall, the first impression was standard tab target decent. The missions were very concise and clear about what you needed to do, with an easy to read quest tracker as well as many markers on the minimap utilizing different symbols depending on what you needed to do. Whether that's a turn in, an action that needs completed in a portion of the map, or a different area that you need to access. I quickly realized the majority of my experience was coming from actually turning in missions rather than participating in combat though that gave a sizable chunk of experience as well. There is something here that I really want to emphasize, as it was a pretty unique thing for myself personally, I've never really experienced this before. When I first logged in and saw the user interface, and with the previous expectations of franchise games being a little gimmicky, I think I actually gave myself a negative first perspective of the game. But within one single hour of playtime, I was having an absolute blast, and things that I was first noticing as dislikes about the game, for example the UI, the color scheme, and the readability, was becoming less and less of a problem. I was having so much fun and getting completely caught up in my character's story. I just wanted to point that out because first impressions are so integral to the beginning of any new game or story or MMO. And even though my first impressions were on the more negative side with this game, after just a mere one hour of gameplay, I was already changing my mind. This just goes to show that you can never really judge a book by its cover, and I was super excited to continue my journey. At this point, I began to interact with the quick travel system. Essentially, you can quick travel to anywhere on the map that has this little indicator. Your quick travel costs a very trivial amount of money, but it has a cooldown of 6 minutes, which can eventually be upgraded to have no cooldown at all. There's also a galaxy map that features 33 different planets or worlds that you can travel to, each varying in size and generally acting as a new zone. Some of these are massive explorable places with vast open areas, and others are akin to a giant spaceship that acts as a player hub. If your quick travel is currently on cooldown, you can also use the transport system that's available in almost every zone, each with its own unique way of getting around the map, usually involving a flying ship or a speeder, but sometimes taking a train or riding a giant flying manta ray. At this point, I was level 6, still just starting out, but I was beginning to question how and why I had never tried this game before. I have some very early memories of playing another Star Wars MMO known as Star Wars Galaxies, but how had the Old Republic evaded me for so long? I was having a blast and the honeymoon stage had surely set in at this point. The world was fascinating. My character's story was compelling, my decisions were impactful, the combat was feeling good as I was beginning to acquire more abilities, and this is what I would like to call the first stage of addiction. At this point, I played around a bit with the UI, and I was able to get the map off of the center of my screen and into a corner, more akin to a mini-map that you might find in other games. I also added some more action bars. You'll notice throughout this video that my interface might change here and there, as it took me a while to really find the customization that I liked best. At level 7, I fought my first elite mob after summoning the creature from a pool of blood, 
and my character was also beginning to form a bit of a personality. Like I mentioned, I generally play heroic, good guy characters in games, so I decided moving forward that I would be the most sarcastic asshole of all time. If there was a sarcastic chat option, that's what I chose. If I could make a joke in a very serious situation that disregarded everyone's feelings, that's what I did. Being a Sith Inquisitor constantly gave me the option to exact physical violence on the people that I was chatting with through shocking them, which I also did, constantly. Around level 12 is when I finally acquired my first companion, Kem Val. Interestingly enough, I just recently played EverQuest 2 and praised the game on its excellent mercenary system, essentially giving you a group member to travel the world with and participate in what might have once been group content, but solo. So I was quite surprised to see a similar system here. Essentially, as you progress through the story, you'll find different notable characters who can act as your companion. Each of them have their own storyline and an influence system which you can level up as you increase your relationship with each of these characters. And I mean, these relationships are no joke. You can even get romantically involved. Your companions are always the same level as you and can participate in a few different roles, though I generally kept my companion on the healer role as constantly getting healed the whole time made everything a lot easier. Finally, it was time to progress within the story and the game prompted me to travel to some new places. First of all, I was introduced to the Imperial Fleet, which is essentially a player hub. I noticed this guy was levitating and I thought, hey, I want to levitate. But I quickly moved on to Dromund Kass, a more forested area with an interesting diverse set of mobs. And it was here that I realized I had story quests for my class, but also story quests for each world. This is also where I noticed that level scaling began to take effect. Essentially, while leveling, you might notice that your level will be scaled down when you're in a certain zone so that you don't completely destroy everything in your path. No matter your actual level, completing the missions in that zone will still give you the same or sizable chunk of XP scaled to your level, which allows you to pick and choose and have more options in the actual worlds or areas or zones that you might want to level your character in. At this point, I was doing enough traveling that I really wanted a mount. However, as a free-to-play player, you don't get access to mounts until level 20 versus level 10 as a subscribed player. Questing around Droman took me to level 17, and I even got this new set of gear. I was beginning to feel like a badass, though looking back on this now as someone who has much, much more playtime, I still looked like a complete noob. One small annoyance I was beginning to notice is that oftentimes when initiating a quest with a cutscene, which is the majority of quests, it can actually take a second to load. Usually this wasn't an issue, but I had a few times while playing where this took upwards of 10 to 15 seconds to load in the cutscene. It's a small thing, pretty inconsequential, but it's just something I noticed. I finally got to level 20 where I was greeted with a notification detailing to me the importance of subscribing, as I would be getting reduced experience rates from this point forward. Apparently if you don't subscribe, it reduces your experience by about 25%. However, so far the leveling was so fast, and even after this moment, I hardly noticed a reduction in my leveling speed, if I'm being completely honest. I also went and trained my speeder piloting, which is your mount skill, and I found out after a bit of research online that I wanted to access the GTN, or the Galactic Trade Network, in order to purchase myself a speeder. One problem. Other players set the prices on the Galactic Trade Network, and the cheapest speeder on there was 40k. Okay, a bit more research later, and I found out that there are vendors which sell these mounts for much cheaper, only 8,000. But then I found out the real loophole, the real cheat code, if you will. NY Cantina 16, a free mount for any player. There are a few other codes for other mounts and pets that I'm assuming was released as some promotional item for some event, presumably in the year 2016. Either way, I'll take it. I was officially cruising. Though I will admit this mount was rather big. Some more questing later and I was level 23. This time I actually was starting to look a little bit more badass. I was quickly directed to the zone of Nar Shadda. I think that's how you pronounce it, but I was completely blown away. The entire zone and planet is really a massive crawling cityscape that's been dominated by buildings and industrialization for millennia. One thing the Old Republic does so well is its color design within zones. No one two places in the game feels exactly the same. Each planet has drastically different colors, designs, and areas, and allows each one to feel completely unique. Nar Shadda was truly a jaw drop moment for me when I entered, even this golden statue of not Jabba, as I learned, and these hologram trees, I was completely blown away. 
While questing around here, I got up to level 28, and I was beginning to notice that I hadn't received any new abilities in quite some time. Actually, each combat style has its own set of abilities that you will automatically get at certain level thresholds, sometimes with quite a bit of space between receiving new abilities. There doesn't seem to be any particular rhyme or reason to when you actually attain these new abilities. For example, most of my character's new abilities would happen only on even levels. But then, randomly at level 51, I got the ability Dual Saber Throw. Either way, I was beginning to really enjoy the combat in this game. Much more than I was originally. It's actually quite a bit more in depth than just your standard tab target. I had buffs that had to be reapplied every few moments, I had combos of skills that would enhance my other abilities depending on which ones I used first. But the absolute coolest part is the movement. I have an ability that would launch me towards whatever I was targeting, landing with a smash, dealing a decent amount of damage. This was so much fun to use, constantly just jumping into an entire group of enemies and starting to lay down some AoE, it was genuinely so satisfying. You can even activate the ability in midair. Sometimes I wasn't able to see an enemy to use the ability, but if I jumped and I acquired line of sight, then my character would fly towards them. It's seriously addicting, and because so much of the game and questing revolves around combat, allowing it to feel really fluid and fun just makes the entire experience of playing the game even better. However, if I had one annoyance about the combat system, it's that the tab targeting didn't work as well as I noticed in other games. It's often difficult to see and keep track of which NPC that you're actually targeting due to all of the effects happening on the screen in combat. And on top of that, sometimes when you tried to change targets, it would go to one that your character wasn't necessarily facing or you were expecting. It's a small thing and it's not too noticeable unless you're fighting many mobs at the same time, but it was something I noticed quite frequently while I was playing. So far, my Sith Marauder is the only character that I've played, but I'm excited to try new characters and see what other mobility and cool combat interactions exist. Something that I absolutely have to mention at this point though, is every single time that I launch this game, literally every single time, I have to accept the terms and conditions, the T's and C's. You have to scroll through two pages of dialogue. I researched this issue online, and while not everyone has the same issue, a lot of people do. Like, way too many people. If anyone has a fix for this, please let me know in the comments. It's not the end of the world, however, it's a little bit annoying. Anyways, afterward, I was directed to Tatooine. A massive zone featuring a large desert expanse that... I... well... It was probably my least favorite zone to quest in across my entire time playing. I don't even know why, if it was just the endless desert or the story within the area or my new sarcastic companion that originally pissed me off. But after questing there, I had achieved level 30, and I realized I had played the game basically entirely solo at this point. So I decided to check out some of the activities that are available. You could queue up for a multitude of things from PvE to PvP to solo encounters where basically your level will scale and all of them can reward a sizable chunk of XP. So I queued up for my first veteran flashpoint, essentially a four-man dungeon with a variety of mobs. You'll get incentivized to join up and do these pretty early on as you start to get quests that you will direct you to finish or complete objectives within these flashpoints. I would love to say that I had a stellar first experience, however, we ran into a bit of group trouble. Even though I had no idea what I was doing, and I was just following along with my teammates, they began to argue. They were calling each other leeches and saying that the other was providing no help to the group. Me, as an actual leech, decided to stay silent and hope that things worked out for the better. But eventually, one of those teammates left. And then my game crashed. I'm not even kidding, my game hadn't crashed up until this point and has not crashed since then. I took it as a sign that maybe I'm not ready to participate in the group content just yet, and I decided to tackle that later on when I had more experience with the game, as I didn't want to mess with people's leveling. Plus, the story's so good, I was itching to get back to it. So I got myself to level 34 while questing in some new areas, and even got myself some definitely badass gear. It was at this point that I was beginning to enjoy the game so much that I figured it's time I pay for the subscription. I realized I would definitely not be happy stopping at level 60, and on top of that I would like to get back to normal experience rates, not the reduced rates that I had been receiving since level 20. Basically, the subscription unlocks everything else in the game. It's definitely not a complete hindrance to play free-to-play for a while, and I would recommend doing that to just about anybody who is on the fence about the game. But once you begin to get a little bit more invested and you want to progress even further, the subscription is completely worth it, as it unlocks the entirety of the endgame, as well as many small benefits along the way. 
After I reached level 40, I just kept questing. The leveling experience was beginning to slow down slightly, and compared to a lot of other popular MMOs out right now, I felt that this was more akin to an older style of leveling. I'm sure that there's metas and ways to speed level a character super quick, but my experience as a new player and playing through the storyline is that leveling was a bit slower and more impactful in Star Wars The Old Republic. But not so slow that it was becoming tedious. It was a nice balance, and it was fun to feel and see my character become more and more powerful. I leveled through the poisonous gases of Quesh into the frozen icy tundra that is White Maw. I found this awesome looking tomb area in the corner of Belsavis. Oh, and also, I think I just hooked up with an alien. I'm pretty sure my character is in love with and potentially looking to get married to an alien. Awesome. Now, then something kind of strange happened. Around level 48, I came across my first gathering and trade skills trainers. This completely blew me away, as for some reason in my entire time playing, I had never even noticed or thought of trade skills. The game had not incentivized me to learn or train any of them, and probably a little bit due to my own ignorance, I had basically not seen any gathering nodes or resources out in the world. I decided to look into it a bit, and essentially they work like this. You have gathering skills and crafting skills. Essentially, gather resources, create items. Pretty standard. However, you also have crew skills. Your character has access to a ship and a crew that you can send on missions to go and participate in these skills and gather resources of their own. Now, I aim to make these videos and explore most parts of the game that I find interesting and compelling. But to be honest, I was not particularly enticed or incentivized at all to participate in these skills for the time being. I had no real desire to go and train these skills just yet, and I figured that I could work on that later when I was higher level and or I had completed most of the questing and leveling that I was looking to do. But the fact that I completely overlooked trade skills even existing in this game is pretty interesting to me. I don't know if that's ever happened to me in any other MMO that I've played. Sure, I've played games with bad trade skill systems where I don't enjoy the gameplay loop, but my complete ignorance of their existence really surprised me here. Of course, like I said, some of it is born out of my own ignorance, but I feel as though they could do a better job showing new players that these systems are indeed in the game and can be worked on and trained. Another thing that I would like to talk about is my legacy level. Legacies are a really cool way that the Old Republic introduced account-wide progression. You can actually craft relationships between your characters through a family tree, making them siblings and children and even spouses. Through your legacy level, you can unlock things that will be unlocked across all of your characters. I'm almost always okay with account-wide progression systems, as they generally allow you to avoid doing multiple tedious grinds on multiple different characters. That can begin to become redundant and feel bad to do time and time again. Essentially, with your legacy level, you can unlock certain things, such as the increased fast travel cooldown, and when you unlock that thing, every one of your characters also unlocks it moving forward. Also, when you reach level 50 with a particular character, whatever species that character is can be unlocked to play with any class moving forward. This allows for a lot more customization of different types of interesting characters that you might want to try out later on. Anyways, I continued leveling, doing lots of cool quests, one had a mind prison, and when I was entering the zone of Voss, I fought against nightmares. I even upgraded my quick travel down to two minutes, which felt fantastic. And also, I learned, get this, you can zoom out farther. <laughs> it only took me 55 levels of gameplay to realize that this was a feature. The new field of view was fantastic. Also, I picked myself up a bit of a smaller speeder because I was positively swimming in cash at this point. I made my way to Corellia, which unbeknownst to me at the time is actually where you finish your character's story progression. I still had plenty of planets that I needed to quest in, but I was just following my class storyline for a while as I was pretty caught up in it. Corellia was another cityscape-esque zone with some fantastic questing and truly badass cutscenes. At this point, I had acquired level 60, which is the level cap for free-to-play players. This took me about 50 hours of game time, though hardly efficient as I spent so much time listening to the story and exploring the different worlds and completing side quests. I was curious about other parts of the game and I decided to try my hand at some of the different PvP game modes. So first up, War Zones. These are the domination type game mode where you and your team fight to capture certain objectives while slaying as many of the enemies as possible. I had an absolute blast in these. First of all, your character gets scaled to level 80 and it seems to be fairly balanced in terms of player power. I mean, at least I wasn't getting completely one shot as I might or might not have in other MMOs PvP. 
However, my stealth abilities seemed a little bit overpowered at times as it allowed me to engage or disengage with quite a bit of an advantage. And also the crowd control was a little bit out of this world. I was constantly locked up in stuns and although I had a freedom ability, it had a much longer cooldown compared to the amount of time that I spent stunned. Secondly, we have the Starfighter PvP where you literally join a galactic space fight where you operate one of your ships and fight in a team against enemies in their ships. I got completely and utterly destroyed. I mean, like, I got wiped off the face of the planet, the galaxy. I had no clue where I was getting attacked from. I had no clue who was attacking me. It seems like it could be a lot of fun, but my utter confusion in terms of the gameplay just left to me getting melted. I love PvP in MMOs, especially your standard war zones or arenas, but when it comes to spaceship fighting, well, I just have no experience in that type of gameplay, so it's definitely not for me. But if you want to live out your Star Wars ship fighting fantasy, I can see some massive appeal in this game mode for certain people. All in all, at this point, I felt like I had experienced enough of Star Wars The Old Republic to share my first impressions of the game and to offer my thoughts on how this game stacks up in the year 2023. The one main thing that stood out to me while playing this game is that it almost feels like a single player RPG with many multiplayer elements. The story and the sense of progression is on par and similar to other single player RPGs, but then if you want to hop into some PvP or do some flashpoints, you can queue up and play with others whenever you'd like. If you want to do some heroic missions, you can simply ask in general chat if anyone else is interested. You definitely don't have to play with other players, but there is plenty to do if you want to. Let's go through some of my favorite parts about Star Wars, and then some parts that I didn't like, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. Firstly, favorites. Number one. And it has to be number one. The story in this game is diverse, engaging, voice acted, dynamic depending on your choices, and you essentially get eight different stories as you can play through the game as eight different characters, all with their own storylines. You can be good, you can be evil, you can be heroic, you can be weak, you could be exceptionally kind, you can be extremely sarcastic. The options give this game a sense of variety and replayability that I just haven't seen in other MMOs. Number two, the absurd size of this game from planet to planet that feels completely unique and different and interesting in each zone, you enter through different color schemes, map designs, and the overall vibes from sprawling cityscapes to massive outdoor worlds with no sign of civilization, it gives you an overall sense of non-stop exploration. Number three. The feeling of your character's power growing while you progress through a somewhat slower leveling process that really allows you to enjoy your character and see them getting more and more powerful. It's something that gets lost in modern MMOs at times and I'm glad to see this game stick to those roots. And finally, the fluid and fun combat system along with your mercenary that allows you to take on so much content. Going up against many mobs at the same time, not quite at the level of your typical ARPG hack and slash, but still to a satisfying degree. Also, the jumps, man. I love the jumps. Now, some of the things that I think could use some work. Number one, while new players are introduced to the story and the main gist of the game fairly quickly, there are a lot of systems that even now I haven't really interacted with too much. The crafting system being one of them with my crew skills that I could be sending out, I wish the game did a better job of introducing the player to these things so they don't go unnoticed. Number two, Interaction with other players felt mostly limited to a few select game modes. While the single player option of this game can be perceived as a benefit in a lot of ways, at the end of the day it's an MMORPG and I think more player interaction could be incentivized in certain areas to create a better sense of community. Number three, the visual clutter during combat was sometimes a bit excessive to the point that it was difficult to tell exactly which NPC I was targeting and even what was fully happening at the time. Though this was usually only when facing a large group of enemies. And finally, just a small amount of jankiness. Not a lot, but enough to say it's noticeable. From me having to accept the T's and C's every time I launch the game, to having to use the slash stuck command in more than a few scenarios where sometimes I was literally stuck or my player couldn't exit combat. This is by no means game breaking, but it's just some small annoyances that could probably be easily fixed up and prevented. All in all, Star Wars The Old Republic was genuinely one of the better gaming experiences I've had concerning MMOs, especially considering it's set in the Star Wars sci-fi universe, generally an area that I'm not even particularly interested in. My expectations were not only met, but exceeded by this game, and I would definitely recommend giving this game a try, even in the year 2023. Am I going to continue playing? Absolutely. I'm going for level 80. I want to get more involved in war zones and PvP, and I most definitely want to try out a lot of the different characters' origin stories. 
Even if you, like me, have prior expectations concerning Star Wars and some of the games that you might have tried in the past didn't live up to your expectations, please don't let that influence your decision regarding The Old Republic, because this game is fantastic. I could easily see myself sinking hundreds if not thousands of hours into this game, and that's just based on story alone. However, I will say if you're not very interested in the story and you don't care much for your character's decisions and the way that they change and interact with the game, then the decent combat and feeling of progression is still there to back it up after the fact. Anyway folks, thank you all for tuning in. If you made it to the end of the video, don't forget to drop a like, comment, tell me your favorite origin story you've played, and if you haven't played, well then tell me what you had for breakfast. And also, think about subscribing. If you really enjoyed the content, there is a link to my Patreon down in the description. But thanks again, and I will catch you all in the next one. Later. <laughs>